How's everyone doing? Good! Can we give it up for the brave Indian woman who did not go to medical school? <laughs> born in this tiny, dusty village in India, is now having a bit of a career crisis and is doing stand-up. <laughs> I can see her here next month. I, I see what these guys are doing, because they put the funny brown girl on first. Oh. <laughs> boring brown girl on first. And, you know, I mean, I am here as the serious scientist from Stanford, which is quite a burden. <laughs> I, I didn't always used to be so scientific. I, um, I'll start with a quick confession. I used to be a conspiracy theorist. And I have to give you the context so you don't judge me too hard. Right? I grew up in England in a really conservative Indian Muslim family. And the family and the community at large actually remembered often and remembered very vocally how the Brits had pillaged our land and engineered a genocide partition which killed millions of people. So this was like constant dinner table talk about what the Brits did. And you may have heard of this saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire said with a lot of pride, right? But we, and probably about a billion other people to talk about it, used to add something on, which was, the sun never sets on the British Empire, and the blood never dries. So I was raised by my auntie, and on my cousin brother's bedroom wall, we had a world map. And every country that the Brits had colonized was colored pink. And let me tell you, one, quarter of the planet's landmass was pink on this damn map. So you can imagine, right, it just feels so absurd that this tiny island at a jaunty angle in the North Sea could have that much brutality, that much ambition even, to take over the world. So it wasn't that much more absurd, I don't think, that on Saturday mornings, me and my cousins and our friends, we'd gather in a circle around our one cassette player, this was the 80s, and we would listen to these cassette tapes that would circulate throughout our community. And these cassette tapes taught us really important life lessons, things like, the royal family is not human. <laughs> The royal family is made up of shape-shifting reptiles. Uh, I mean, you're judging, but take a look at like, their eyes. <laughs> it would say stuff like, the Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, he's a, he's a lizard. And I'm, I'm forgetting that, so it was a long time, but like, I think princesses Anne and Margaret were like some kind of geckos or something. Uh -huh. There were all these theories. We used to listen to these cassette tapes that also said that the Queen Mother, who was alive then, they said that she was actually dead, but pickled and propped up and rolled out to royal brothers and was made to look alive. There were also these tapes that would play Michael Jackson songs backwards. And so you would hear shouted at you through the tape, Satan, Satan, Satan. The whole argument was that MJ was a Satan worshipper and the Antichrist. So there were also these books that we read that had conspiracy theories. We weren't just listening to cassette tapes, we were reading books. Um, and the books would tell us all these stories, these theories, about how governments were trying to kill off brown people by poisoning our food and our water. So we're kids, right? And we're like, we already have all this evidence that governments and the British family, their crooks and their killers, look what they've done. So, I mean, who were we supposed to believe? We didn't know. Now, the, the shape-shifting reptile thing may have caught you by surprise a little bit, and I know I'm weird, but I know I'm not alone in ever having believed a conspiracy theory, I think, even though we don't admit it, that it's pretty common. So, um, help me feel a bit less alone in my weirdness. If you now, or have ever, believed in a conspiracy theory, I want you to clap for me. They were trying to have Paul McCartney appear as though he were dead because of the symbols, etc. 
Oh, I like that one. I probably heard that one in the 80s too. I just forgot. Look at all the candy. Um, so yeah, it turns out that a lot of us believe in conspiracy theories. And I want to just ask you, give you a couple of scenarios, and you shout back to me whether you think these things happened or whether you think they are complete bunk. So let me think, because there's so many in my head right now. I love these kinds of theories. Okay, let's do this one. Did American doctors, funded by the American government, go to Guatemala, scrape the skin off the penises of men in Guatemala, rub syphilis into those scrapes, and study them? True. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you guys think it's true? I'll tell you in a second whether you're right or not. Let's do an, oh, let's do another American one. <laughs> so many. Um, <laughs> Doctors working for the American government withhold penicillin from black men in the South who had syphilis. True. True. Okay. Okay. Um, let's do one from Europe since that's where I'm from. Where I think I'm from. I don't know where we stand with that at the moment. <laughs> I don't want to go there either. Okay. Um, did doctors and scientists working for the pharmaceutical company Bayer test aspirin on prisoners in Nazi concentration camps? Yeah. <laughs> So okay, yeah. few people said it, but some of you are saying that's true. Okay, we did one last one. Back to America, because by now I'm here. Um, did the Pentagon run a secret bioweapons unit that took bugs, specifically ticks, and engineered them so the ticks could spread many, many diseases at once, and then did the Pentagon secret bioweapons unit release those super ticks into the wild? True. Yes. Okay, so this half of the room seems to think so. Yeah. debate because Congress is investigating right now whether this alleged behavior happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, I don't know, the government investigating the government feels a bit like me killing one of my patients and saying, don't look, I will try and investigate it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how they will. The other ones are true, sadly. They all happened. Um, and they are also chapters in a book I'm writing that comes out next month, or next year rather, called Debunked. And Debunked dissects these kinds of supposed med medical myths and the many medical conspiracy theories that circulate, but really it asks the questions that I am obsessed with, which are, how are you supposed to know what to believe? And why do we believe the things that we believe? I'm really interested in that. Like, say if a scientist says to you, vaccines are safe, vaccines save lives, but then Gwyneth Paltrow is like, no, vaccines are so bad for your energy, and here's a jade egg which you should charge in the light of a full moon and then shut up your vagina for a longer life. Like, why is it that you might believe Gwyneth Paltrow over the scientist? Fuck at me, um, which might just be a really natural reaction to me talking about Gwyneth Paltrow, but it might also be because you received a piece of paper at some point that said on it, if you see Pikachu on up here, shout fuck really loud, the person who shouts it loudest will get 20 bucks. And you know what? It's true. So if you think you were the loudest, don't come to me because I'm an academic. I don't have one. Three men who run this show have loads of it. <laughs> dirty experiment, if you like, a quick and dirty exercise to see how information spreads and what kind of behavior it incites. Because this is my jam. This is what I study now. It turns out that you know how we look at disease and how disease spreads and you get a disease epidemic? Well, disease is not the only thing that is contagious. Information is contagious too. So this is what I study, but it's not what I've always studied. I first moved to America in 2011, gave up my very steady job as a hospital doctor in England, and came here to join something called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which is a branch of the military in the federal government that uh, is a group of doctors that's deployed to basically um, go into a helicopter into the, the hot zone of an epidemic, try and track the disease and stop more people getting sick. And yes, I came to work for the same federal government that I just told you did all these really unethical things to black and brown people, but I do think that if you're gonna have a high moral bar for your employer, you're just never gonna have a job and <laughs> Santo that actually, you know, let me afford my rent in Palo Alto, so there is that. But I came 
came here for that job, and the first thing that I saw was, yes, I'd be in an epidemic, and yes, I'd be trying to track the disease, but the disease was not the only damn thing that was spreading. There were rumors, myths, conspiracy theories about the disease spreading alongside it, and oftentimes helping the disease spread. Now, granted, sometimes that information was great. It was the information I wanted people to have. It was alerting them to signs and symptoms of the disease spreading. It was telling them where to go and get help. But way too often, it was misinformation and disinformation. So real quick, misinformation is false information that spread without intent of malice. So for example, um, Misinformation is like me saying, hey friend, we're in a place where there's an Ebola epidemic, but I heard that if you eat ground coffee and raw onions, which actually these were rumors that spread during the West African Ebola epidemic, I think if you eat those things, you will be safe. Now those things are not true, but I'm sharing that untrue information, thinking that it is, and I'm trying to help you. Disinformation is quite different. It's still misinformation, but it's, sorry, it's not false information, but it's being spread with a deliberate intent to disrupt and harm. Tons and tons of examples of disinformation often by bad actors. Uh, we saw it in the US during that West African border epidemic too. There's also this phenomenon called misinfodemics. I think that's such a great term. It was coined by two women, obviously two women, <laughs> at Harvard, Nat Jenis and Anna Mina. You should look them up, they're fantastic. And they came up with this term, misinfodemics, which is epidemics of misinformation. And they really, like me, are trying to get us to think about the fact that disease does not spread in isolation. It spreads alongside rumors, myths, and conspiracy theories. Theory. So we're seeing this now in the DRC. I hope you've seen the news, right? This awful Ebola epidemic, the second deadliest Ebola epidemic in history is going on right now. And there's all sorts of rumors about the disease spreading, and that's really stopping the outbreak responders from getting a handle on it. There's rumors like, don't trust the foreign doctors that are coming in. Rumors like, it's the government that started this. And just yesterday, I learned that people who are being brave enough to get the experimental Ebola vaccine are being murdered by their townspeople because the, the, the claim is the Ebola is in the vaccine. And so we saw this during the 2014-2016 West African Ebola epidemic too, and that's why it kind of really irks me that they would send in people like me with this really narrow focus of the disease, the disease, when actually there was all this other stuff circulating around the disease, and we should have been looking at that too. So often when you're in the hot zone, you do some really unglamorous, non-technical, back of the envelope calculations, and then you do some fancier ones on computers that show you how the disease is spreading. You see these clusters, you see sometimes you can find your um, patient zero and your index patient like that. But what I want to say to you is that these maps of disease spread look so similar to the maps of information spread, whether that's rumors, whether that's text messages, whether that's tweets. And in fact, the mathematical models that I used to use to figure out where's the epidemic going, how can I project where it's going next or how big it's gonna get, we can use these same mathematical models to look at how information is spreading too. So anyway, let me take you back to 2011. I arrived in America and just, I arrived just as this film comes out, Contagion. I don't know if you've seen it or you may have heard about it. It was quite a big film at the time. And Kate Winslet is playing someone who has the exact job that I moved here for. She's playing an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which should have been my first sign that this was going to be a shit show. And it did not end well for Kate. I should have run at that point, but I didn't know better. I was 29, I was really naive. Um, and I had these really glamorous thoughts about what it would look like to be a disease detective. Like, yeah, I'm going to have my bag packed and by the door. And whenever there's a call, I'm just going to go into the hot zone. I'm going to save all these lives. Like, I have these delusions of grandeur. Um, yeah, and it wasn't really like that. Um, I thought I'd be chasing really exotic diseases, emerging diseases. There was some weird stuff. There were some outbreaks that kept getting sent to a mass paralysis. One where I had to wear a stab vest and a, a face shield and a helmet because it was an outbreak of paralysis in a maximum security men's prison. So there were some outbreaks like that, but 
for the vast majority, like the bane of my fucking life, <laughs> as a disease detective, is freaking measles and whooping cough and mumps. And I was like, I did not move to America for these pedestrian medieval <laughs> oxygen tank air all the time. <laughs> I just kept getting freaking measles and I was like, what the hell is going on? When I arrived, we were seeing this massive uptick in cases, measles, whooping cough, all of those things. And I have to be honest with you, right? Because my generation of doctors, we learned what measles looks like from pictures like this in our text. This is like a 19th century depiction of the rash of measles. But like seriously, we weren't seeing patients with measles in the 2000s when I was in med school. We were learning what measles looks like from black and white photos of kids in England in the 1940s. But I get here, and there's like one outbreak after the other after the other. I was like so pissed off about it. <laughs> and you know, you have to be careful what you ask for, because I asked for strange, and boy, did I get strange. Because the thing that I had to investigate was like, parents would not vaccinate their kids so their kids would get measles. And then the parents would shove like a hundred lollipops in their kid's mouth, hoping not at the same time, but you get my point. And then they would take these measles coated lollipops, package them individually, put them into envelopes, ship them via USPS, which is very illegal, didn't you know? And then send them to parents across the country who were paying for these measles lollipops. And then those parents were putting the measles coated lollipops in their kid's mouth because they wanted their kids to get measles and not get the measles vaccine. It was like so, I had so many weird things. There were measles parties and chicken pox parties. And it's like we have vaccines that can save your kids from permanent neurologic damage, which can occur from measles. Like it's not a mild disease. So it was one thing after another like that. It was absurd. There was this one outbreak I had to investigate in a neonatal intensive care unit where the kids are like, they're preemies. They're like, you can hold them in your hand. They are so small. And there was an outbreak of whooping cough in the neonatal intensive care unit. My hypothesis going in was it's going to be a visitor. Turned out it was healthcare workers who did not get vaccinated, who coughed on the kids. They went into work while they had whooping cough. And the kids nearly died with babies when they died from it. So it was stuff like that day in, day out. Then this weird thing happened in Texas, and I put this story at the beginning of my book, Debunked. Uh, long story short, I moved to Texas in 2014, partly because I can't hold a single job for more than two years, but also because I kind of got fed up with that, just focused on the disease angle. And I was noticing that the anti-vaxxers were amazing at storytelling. Like, they knew how to cook up a narrative, make it emotional and compelling. So I was like, I need to learn what they do to counter that. So I went to journalism school, finished journalism school, got offered a job at the Dallas Morning News, a newspaper in Texas, never been to Texas, didn't know if I wanted to go to Texas, but my bar for employment was quite low at that point. So I arrive in Texas, and I kid you not, a few weeks after I arrive in Texas, Ebola arrives. <laughs> right where I'm living, in Dallas. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. We had one case, that poor man, who came from Liberia. Uh, he got sick actually in Dallas. He wasn't sick on the way. Um, and he went to a hospital, as you would. He went to an ED. They told him he had sinus infection and sent him home with antibiotics. And of course, he died from Ebola. It was really sad. But, you know, everything was a freaking shit show. The American media was like, oh, the die from Ebola. All the xenophobia and racism comes percolating to the surface. It doesn't take much to have that show. There were school closures in Dallas. There were um, employers telling people of African descent, don't turn up to work, you might have Ebola. It was terrible. In the midst of all this, there's this woman who takes her kid to the pediatrician, somewhere around the San Antonio area in Texas, this mother takes her kid to the pediatrician and says, here, give her the Ebola shot. And the doctor, this is 2014, it's not even an experimental one no. at this point, and the doctor's like, ma'am, I don't have one. Like, don't point to my fridge like that. We don't have an Ebola shot. And the mum's not happy. She's really freaked out about this ISIS of biological agents in her state. And she's like, give my daughter the Ebola shot. And the pediatrician, uh, being thorough and opportunistic, is like, we don't have an Ebola shot, and even if we did, I wouldn't give it to your kid because the outbreak is 6,000 miles away. But you know what? 
It's the beginning of flu season. Let me give your kid a flu shot. Let me give your kid the flu vaccine. And the mom says, no, vaccines? We don't believe in those things. Oh. Right, I mean, and we're judging, but like, we're, our brains are not great at making like rational decisions. I mean, there's a conspiracy theorist among us, so let's not judge too harshly. But like 80,000 kids or people died 80,000 people died of flu in America last year, right? Zero died from Ebola. We've got people asking for Ebola shots and not wanting to get their flu vaccine. And I'm really interested in the way we make those decisions. I think we are getting a bit better at talking about misinformation in health, and I think we're getting better at mapping the magnitude of the problem, but we're not so great at thinking about interventions. I'm thinking of one at the moment, I'll tell you more about it later, but um, we're not so great at saying, let's try this to see if it works. And there's a good reason for that. There was a study, really recent, where researchers at an American university took parents who were anti-vaccine, and they showed these parents photos of real life kids really, really sick in the hospital with measles and uh, whooping cough and other vaccine-preventable diseases. And what impact did those photos have on the parents? they actually doubled down on their anti-vaccine stance. So that makes you want to tear your hair out because it made me want to tear my hair out. <laughs> Listen to this. The next year, researchers at a different American university took those exact same photos of the sick children, showed them to a different group of parents, and those parents decided, oh, that looks terrible. I will vaccinate my kids. So we're like really struggling to understand how we can um, influence behavior in positive ways. And meanwhile, the anti-vaxxers have kind of really got their hooks sorted. They are really good at sharing their stories. So I'm going to leave you with one final thought, and it might be a controversial one since I've been going on about anti-vaxxers, but I'm going to say like it's easy to hate on them, right? There's all this evidence, millions of data points for sure, that show vaccines are safe. Therefore, it's easy to hate on people who are like, no, I just don't believe in that stuff. I'm also kind of really over doctors and scientists asking for blind faith in science. Because I'm like, the science screwed itself in the foot from the time we were doing these unethical experiments on people. And don't forget, eugenics not that long ago was good science. So I'm kind of done with that. The, the conundrum I have there is if I'm saying to you, yes, look, black and brown people have tons of reasons to not trust the establishment, then riddle me this. Because when I look at the demographic data, the majority of people in this country who are not vaccinating their kids and themselves are white. And they are well off and they are well educated by some markers, right? And I look at that and I'm like, come on, white people, what do you have to not trust in? <laughs> in your favor, I don't get it. But um, I think if we're gonna try and understand white people, we should look to their leader, Gwyneth Paltrow. Because <laughs> um, I think a lot of what's happening with those decisions is tribalism, the strength of collective belief and our really deep-seated need to belong. So what happens, because if you look at the country as a whole, thankfully, pretty decent vaccination rates, like, you know, across the board, you average them out, what you end up with is these deep pockets of really low vaccination rates, like really low, those are the hotbeds for these epidemics. And I think when you look in those areas, what's happening is someone's like, oh, Gwyneth Paltrow said um, vaccines are not safe, and also that she invented yoga, which from my hands <laughs> Um, and then other people are like, oh yeah, you don't like vaccines. You know, we don't vaccinate in my household either. And then another person's like, I'm not going to go against this belief we have in our community, and I'm not going to vaccinate either. And I think that's what's happening. Like, we can't, we don't want to believe that that's what's happening, but we can't undercount the need for belonging, and therefore the way we see that kind of information contagion happening. I will say that I got kind of happy recently because Gwyneth Paltrow had a group convention in London and there was a mini revolt there. And I was like, oh my God, what were they revolting over? Finally, the science is trickling through and like finally we're cracking through the wellness industry to show them that it's all yes. So I looked online, so I was like, why is everyone pissed at Gwyneth in London? And it was over the price of the gluten-free breakfast. Bill Gates might be right when he says that pandemic flu and measles are going to wipe us all out. And I'm going to end on that note, so thank you for coming. <laughs>